Um, so welcome to Writing Against Displacement. We've got like a really, really awesome lineup for you. Um, this evening, Tomi Arai, uh, Jessica Hagedorn, and Tony Robles are all here. Um, Tony is coming in from the West Coast, so thank you so much. Um, that's really exciting <laughs> to have you here in New York. Uh, we're going to hear some activist voices and voices that are underrepresented, and we're so honored to share their stories here tonight. Um, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time, so I'm going to go ahead and start introducing uh, Tomi. So Tomi Arai is a public artist who collaborates with writers, architects, historians, curators, and local communities cr to create work that explores the rich cultural diversity of the Americas. She is a founding collective member of the Chinatown Art Brigade, a cultural collective that recognizes the power of art to advance social justice and works to fight housing displacement in Chinatown with local grassroots organizers. She has designed permanent public works of art for the New York City Percent for Art program, the San Francisco Art Co Arts Commission, the MTA Arts for Transit program, the New York City Board of Education, and the US General Services Administration Administration Art and Architecture Program. Her latest public commission will be an architectural glass mural for the new Central Subway Station in San Francisco Chinatown, sponsored by the SFMTA. Everybody, please welcome Tomi. Oh, hello, Asian American Writers Workshop and friends. It's uh, such a thrill to be here, and um, oops. Uh, actually, I, uh, when I was contacted by the Asian American Writers Workshop and I knew that the theme was writing against displacement, I, I kind of had to think a little bit harder about what I was going to talk about. But I realized that actually um, I was asked to talk about the Chinatown Art Brigade, which is, um, uh, and I'm going to read a statement from the brigade. And what we do is messaging, and we kind of use a sledgehammer to uh, share these messages around displacement. And you know, nothing like the what I believe would be the highly crafted work of Jessica and Tony. But um, uh, I'm I focused on that tonight, and uh, I'm going to be showing you some images from work we've done. And uh, I'm I'd like to actually start off by saying that I see a couple folks from the Chinatown Art Brigade in the audience. Um, I see Liz Moy in the back. Can you wave your hand? Oh, and Man Si Kong. And uh, I, I see, um, well, Alina and uh, Linda in the third row. So thank you so much for your support, guys. Um, I think uh, displacement is a big topic. And uh, you know, I think that um, you know, we're all coming or responding to it from very different places. Um, I'm actually going to be 69 in a couple of weeks, and so I really feel my age. I'm the uh, senior member of the Chinatown Art Brigade, and I, I guess you might be looking at me and thinking, well, how can someone my age actually suddenly become involved in a radical collective? Um, and. I guess my answer is, it isn't hard, but it is hard to sustain it. Um, it takes a lot of work, and I feel like I made a 360-degree turn in my artistic career to be able to focus on, on doing work that's very different and not market-driven and not created in a studio. So um, you know, I'm very pleased to be able to share uh, the work that we've been doing in the last two years, because this is a work in progress. Um, we're all approaching it in our own way, uh, in new ways. And um, so uh, you know, I hope you'll look at it um, from that point of view. So let's see. Can you, I'm just going to move out of the way a little bit. Um, before I begin, uh, we've recently uh, realized that if we're going to be talking about displacement, we really need to begin every public program we do with some form of territorial acknowledgement. So I do want to say that um, you know, we recognize that we are standing on indigenous land, uh, on Lenape land, and uh, the brigade uh, has been trying very hard to support the struggles of indigenous peoples and um, you know, their struggles to protect their land and their cultures. So um, thank you. Uh, 
And I also wanted to start with actually a quote from Alina, who's in the audience, um, who shared with us this question about Chinatown. How can we show our love for this community in any other way than pro protesting, door knocking, and fighting for our families, our neighborhoods, friends, and ourselves? The Chinatown Art Brigade is a collective of Asian American artists, media makers, and residents with roots in New York Chinatown. We believe that our art, our poetry, our music, our activism, and our love for our neighborhoods and our communities can help build a powerful movement for social justice. Since our founding in 2015, we have organized a series of community-led responses to gentrification and displacement working with our partners, the Chinatown Tenants Union, a division of CAV, Organizing Asian Communities, and other grassroots organizations in the New York area. This past year, we have asked ourselves what it means to work collectively in a market-driven culture. We have questioned the role of artists and galleries as gentrifiers complicit in art washing our neighborhoods. We have explored what it means to organize around political issues to promote art and culture as a way to support community-led and community-centered campaigns for social justice. We expanded our ongoing anti-displacement work to include projections that actively oppose Trump's ban on refugees and immigration from Muslim countries. And we continue to use large-scale projection projects in partnership with The Illuminator, as a highly visual, vis visible platform for local residents. These luminous messages amplify the work of our membership and allies across neighborhood spaces and allow us to respond to the urgency of the moment with shared messages from the field that are written in love and with hang anger and love, are fueled by hope and driven by a deep concern for our neighborhood spaces and our shared futures. We have spent the last 10 months recruiting new members, traveling and building relationships with broad-based coalitions, actively initiating local and national networks of support, broadening our work to include leadership training and skill shares, and deepening our relationships with progressive organizations and activists who align with our values. By creating more intentional spaces for dialogue and engagement in Chinatown, the goal of the Chinatown Art Brigade is to put a more diverse human face on gentrification while generating a nationwide public response to this important issue. Over the course of two years, our work has included mobile public projection projects, workshops, placekeeping walks, films, exhibitions, public panels, town halls, protests, and direct actions. Developing close working relationships with housing groups, local merchants, cultural partners, and artist collaboratives across the cultural spectrum from the Illuminator and Decolonize This Place to um, Grassroots Asian Rising, Hate Free Zone in Queens, and the WOW Project has been an important and necessary step in mobilizing artists and community residents to work together towards social change. At a time when hyperdevelopment and real estate investments on a global scale threatened to evict and displace the residents who called Chinatown home, we recognize that gentrification and displacement are not just Chinatown issues. Historic neighborhoods from across the country and the world are also at risk, from Johannesburg to Havana, from Boyle Heights in Los Angeles to San Francisco's Mission District, to Treme in New Orleans, to Harlem and Chinatown. Today, more than ever, we see the urgency to connect our separate struggles and act in solidarity. Through projects like Here to Stay, the Brigade is invested in a creative and radical placekeeping process that restores the community and helps us reimagine the built environment across all these threatened spaces. Our work with large-scale mobile light projections and our future work with augmented reality and other forms of technology seeks to blur the boundaries between research and action. As a collective, the Brigade hopes our creative process will challenge authority and open up a space for critical 
thinking and interaction. We are engaged in work that is intentionally situated in community spaces, work that raises questions, links stories together, and asks why these stories matter. Post 9-11, Chinatown has seen the loss of over 600 garment factories and over 15,000 housing units for low-income families. Over 20% of its Chinese population has been forced to relocate with a 30% rise in luxury housing and an increasingly white population threatening to replace the cultural identity of the neighborhood. We are looking at the construction of over 40 hotels and the opening of more than 80 galleries in the Chinatown area, all built at the expense of local residents, often as a result of tenant evictions, displacing small businesses, restaurants, and cultural spaces that have served the community for decades. While what we are witnessing today, what has changed dramatically in the course of the 15 years since the Chinatown Tenants Union was formed, is a housing crisis brought about by the rise of predatory equity, the widespread practice of large-scale corporate, corporate investment in buildings with low-income and rent-stabilized apartments with the goal of renovating and flipping them to acquire market rate value pushing rent-stabilized tenants out through harassment, buyouts, and deliberate negligence. Instead of a handful of individual landlords who are at fault, we are now looking at international conglomerates that own hundreds of buildings in the city, with billionaire real estate moguls like Jared Kushner and corporations like JDS Development acting as major players in the transformation of the city's poor and working-class neighborhoods. What has, been, what has been the Chinatown Tenants Union and the Chinatown Art Brigade's strategy to protect low-income tenants in the face of this hyper-development? In the words of tenant organizer Mel Melanie Wang, tenants don't need to be educated. They experience this in their daily lives. They know what the motive is behind the conditions that they are facing. They know that the motive is profit. They need to be organized going door to door, talking to tenants one-on-one, -on -one, holding meetings, forming tenant associations, legal clinics, offering walk-in consultations, tenants' legal rights training, and sustaining this organizing model has been the Chinatown Tenant Union's strategy for resistance. Their on-the-ground strategy for organizing tenants combined with direct action has also been at the core of what we do as a Chinatown Art Brigade and has guided and inspired our work as artists and activists. By opening up our creative process and by working in close collaboration with groups across the city, the Chinatown Art Brigade hopes to generate a broad response to the themes of refuge, resilience, and resistance. Prior to Trump's anti-Muslim ban, the Chinese were the only ethnic group to be prevented from entering the United States. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 not only banned Chinese immigration, it denied citizenship to American-born Chinese and required all Chinese to register and carry certificates of identity at all times. In the recent news, comparisons have been made between the detention and separation of families at the U.S. border and Trump's fear-mongering rhetoric to the signing of Federal Roosevelt's, Franklin D. Roosevelt's signing of um, Executive Order 9066, a mandate that designated certain areas in the United States as military zones, an act which led to the forced relocation and detention of over 110,000 Japanese Americans for the duration of World War II. As Asian Americans, we have been the targets of policy decisions designed to de deny us citizenship and discriminate against us on the basis of race. And we believe we have a responsibility to show the world that we will not let America's racist history repeat itself. Through our work, we believe that Chinatown and Asians in America should stand united with all those groups who are at risk and who are fighting for their civil rights and for the universal human right to housing, shelter, and safety. So tonight's program and our presentation is a call to action, and we encourage you to join us and other progressive movements for social change by writing your own messages of hope 
by writing your own anti-displacement uh, messages of resilience and resistance. Join us and voice your demands to our government and our mayor. Let them know that we oppose Trump's blatant efforts to divide our country and build walls between us. Let them know we are organizing and we are fighting back. Thank you. So, um, I think this is the reflective part of the program because I know Jessica and Tony are gonna raise it up a notch. Um, I, I think uh, you might have seen uh, a few slides of the People's Pad, which is an interactive platform that we've incorporated into our projections, which allow people to write in real time messages that are projected onto the buildings. Um, and this has been a really exciting and um, successful interactive element um, in, in the things that we do. And um, one of the CAB members, Liz Moy, put together a short video of all the messages that the youth from the Asian, Grassroots Asian Rising Youth Summit that we work with uh, last, uh, this month actually, a couple weeks ago, uh, who came from all over the country to um, participate in a leadership training conference for activists in Philadelphia. And they submitted messages uh, that we projected and so, um, I'm just going to share them with you because uh, when you talk about writings against displacement, I guess this is what came to mind for me. Um, you know, you can go up, get up and <laughs> get a drink of water and you could talk to, talk to your neighbors, there's no sound. But you know, if you want to just sit here and think about some of these messages, you know, please do.
Thank you so much. That was, wow. I think everybody just needs to take like a, a deep breath. Whew. Wow, that was great. OK. <laughs> everybody back? OK. Whew. Novelist, playwright, poet, former punk band leader, Jessica Hagedorn almost needs no introduction. If you aren't aware, she is a legend. She <laughs> if you aren't aware. <laughs> she is the recipient of AAWW's 2011 Lifetime Achievement Award and her 1996 classic of Asian American literature set partially in San Francisco and Manhattan, Gangster of Love is part road novel, part immigrant family drama, and all rock and roll. It recently debuted on stage at the Magic Theater in San Francisco. She is the author of several books, including Dog Eaters, Dream Jungle, and Toxicology. Her list of, accomplishment, uh, of accomplishments is long, but her words are more exciting than mine could ever be. So please welcome Jessica Hagedorn. I want to thank you, um, you Tamea, for being who you are. That was great, and you're just too modest. She's always done this kind of work, so um, don't let her um, downplay herself. And she has been a public artist, thank you, thank you, all her life, uh, as long as I've known her. And um, she's been a muralist, and you know, I'm a wonderful artist. Um, so just find out more about her because she's great. And thank you for sharing all this with us. Um, so um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, and um, it's good to be here with Tony. I'm going to tell you why. First, I have to get comfy. Can this like flatten like a table or not? Does anybody know? Yeah, I can flip it, right? I don't want to break anything. Oh, help. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. No, yeah, I'm just going to use it as a podium. OK, so Gangster of Love was about a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I moved here in the 70s from San Francisco. and migrated to San Francisco from Manila. So um, I've been moving, it seems, all my life. But I live here now. And things were, you know, cities evolve. But I think what we're all talking about is how do they evolve and why? And how the people who would like to continue living in a particular landscape ha are forced to leave. That's a whole other story. And I think that's what we're talking about. Um, I love the kids' thing about where were your papers in 1492. I mean, that is your best line. Um, but I, when I was writing this novel, The Gangster of Love, which was published in hardback in 1995, so um, that's how long ago it was, um, I already knew San Francisco was changing. Um, and uh, I wanted to try and capture some of how I grew up there and what I knew uh, when I was living there and how it affected me and inspired me as an artist. And there were communities there that are no longer there, um, you know. And one of the wonderful artists I met who really helped shape me as a poet before I became a novelist was a man named Al Robles, who was Tony's uncle. And um, we became very, very good friends. I mean, really, like, very tight. And uh, we worked together for the Neighborhood Arts Program in San Francisco. And for us, the Robles family were like our kind of royalty, you know? They were activists. Many of them were artists. And people really loved them and looked up to them for just engagement with the communities. And Al was really, um, he was a legend even in his, you know, 
before he became Al. I mean, I feel like people always spoke of him as, you know, he's the one who's um, uh, dedicated to the Filipino communities and then to the multicultural communities because, believe it or not, for those of you who are very young, uh, San Francisco used to be quite diverse, and it isn't anymore. Gee, I wonder why. Um, Al grew up, I believe, in the Western edition. So he even went against the grain of the usual, you know, where are the Filipinos growing up. And he was um, from the city. The Western Edition, which is one of the neighborhoods I lived in. In fact, it was the last neighborhood I lived in before I moved here to New York. And he was really influenced by music, especially jazz. So we had that in common. And he became this incredibly committed activist to saving the International Hotel. How many of you knew the, about the I Hotel? Because for me, that's um, a landmark in what we're talking about displacement. And the I Hotel was this residential hotel on the border between Chinatown and North Beach in San Francisco. And a lot of older, really old Filipino, ma mainly men actually. I remember because I rented a room there to, to oh, donate right. some money and it was all guys. When I, I didn't see any women living there, but um, old Chinese men and old Filipino men live there and they were all made to leave. It was a historic documentary made by Curtis Choi. So if you can find it, look at it. It's quite something. The fall of the I Hotel and a lot of people tried to stop it. It went on for years. It went on for years. And um, Al was always on the front lines and he was so involved and got us all involved and he just never stopped. So I kind of want to dedicate this part of the program, my part, to him tonight. I think he's here tonight with us. Some of his family's here and it's great, um, besides Tony. And um, I'm going to start with a poem by him. But I also want you to know that I'm going to be reading a, a little excerpt from The Gangster of Love from the novel, which is actually inspired by Al. There's a character called the Carabao Kid, or the Carabao Kid, um, who is based on him. And then I invented some stuff, because I wasn't writing a nonfiction book. I was writing a fiction book, but everybody knew it was Al. And you know, he was so dear to me, and such a spiritual man, that when my mother died, I didn't call a priest, I called Al, and he delivered her, he sort of did the chant at her memorial uh, for her and for all of us. So that was a very deep thing that he did for me. And my mother had a collection of gongs from Mindanao and I gave them to Al. <laughs> he wanted to gong. <laughs> so, I mean, he was, you know, very much part of my life. So this is his poem. It's from his book, Rappin' with 10,000 Carabaos in the Dark. Jazz of my youth. I remember jazz of my youth in the streets of Fillmore, crossing over to Cousin Jimbo's Bop City where the green between his dark ebony fingers flapped in the cool post-street wind. Take the A train and slide all the way down, listening to sounds close to the ground, Fillmore Street bound. Jazz coming round, conga tight skins, crack snapping, all day and all morn, all night session, how high the moon. Laying down in the back room, horns blowing to stars fell on Alabama. As the night fog squeezed in, wailing sounds echoed in the air. The streets sparkled like stars. All the things you are. Jazz of my youth. Cruising over to Soulsville, stepping over chords, guitar strings, cutting loose on tenderly. Jazz of my youth, Jacks on Sutter, Jackson's Nook, 
Step back. Be cool. Head to the back room, thick smoke curling round a brown Filipino man. Blown, it's almost like fallen in love, hunched over a piano. A gray sharkskin overcoat, dark shades, brown fingers running up and down the ivory keys. Dark black hair gleams with three flowers. Charlie Abing, the jazz man from Stockton, blowing sax and piano. What a rare mood I'm in. It's almost like falling in love. Jazz of my youth. Running the mow, the cool streets, talking deep and sweet. I remember you. You're the one that made my dreams come true. He, oh, that was a sweet poem. <laughs> so, um, okay, blessings. Ta -ta. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read from the Carabao Kid chapter, or Carabao Kid. Man, language. Um, so the narrator is named Rocky Rivera, the real Rocky Rivera, and Voltaire is her brother. Ah, the Carabao kid and what he taught us, how to be a Filipino. Voltaire's idealized father figure, and mine too, I suppose, he was this Pinoy poet from Watsonville, with a sleepy, wise face of a water buffalo, a man totally obsessed with the Philippines who'd never been there. In hushed tones, he described the fiery sunsets, the swaying coconut trees, and white sand beaches, sounding like some romantic tourist brochure, kind of ironic and laughable except the kid thought it was funny, too. Oh, yeah, sister, I forgot. I've never been there. America was here, vast, inhospitable, harsh. The Philippines was there, distant, lush, soulful, and sexy. He made constant jokes out of what he called his carabao dreaming and wrote a series of self-deprecating haikus called Existential Pinoy Paralysis, questioning his fears about returning to the homeland. Quote, maybe I just don't want to be disappointed. Unquote. Went one of the more quotable lines in his poem, Maybe. Another ditty was called Expat, versus exile. The fact that Voltaire and I had actually been born in the Philippines had earned us his lasting admiration. It was 1973. Hoy, sister, he calls out when I stroll past Manong Joey's Kayumangi Barbershop on Kearney Street. I'm on my way to see what I can shoplift at City Lights Books. But I can't ignore that loud and insistent s -s -s Filipino greeting. What the fuck, I mutter, annoyed. I stick my head into the dark, tiny storefront. Old Filipino men glare back at me from their pomade-scented gloom. Even in their humble circumstance and advanced age, they exude gangster flash and style chewing on fat cigars while they wait for their haircuts. Acting like millionaires, preening like peacocks, they wear pimpy suits with rakish fedoras or slouchy Panama hats of the softest weave and two-tone wingtips or white patent leather loafers on their feet. Manong Joey is in the midst of putting the finishing touches on some aging, used-to-be gigolos, 
modified pompadour. The beat-up radio is tuned to K-Jazz in this bastion of macho vanity and sartorial glamour. The Carabao kid stands out in his chinos and muddy work boots, his graying hair pulled back in a loose ponytail, his goatee wispy. He's right at home claiming one of Manong Joey's unused barber chairs and swapping tails with the Manongs. They're obviously very fond of him. Kid and the old guys could blah blah all day and all night. Talk story, the kid used to call it. A brown teenage Madonna in bell-bottom jeans, a Santana Abraxas t-shirt, and scuffed cowboy boots sweeps hair off the floor into a dustpan. The kid proudly introduces her as my daughter Ligaya. Same age as you, sister, looks like. She's Monong Joey's goddaughter, all-around assistant, and shampoo girl. Kid had once been an up-and-coming welterweight boxer, but he gave it up after a brutal match. The kid's opponent beat him so bad, he went into a three-day coma. Like Jesus, I said. The kid smiles. Maybe so, sister, but that's when I decided my brain was too valuable. He and Ligaya wander the planet, sleeping bags and everything they own on their backs, claiming no place and every place as their home. Where's your mother? I ask Ligaya. She got fed up, went home. To Watsonville? Ligaya shakes her head. No, to Pangasinan in the Philippines, she adds, looking at me like I'm an idiot. Don't you miss her? Of course. Don't you want to visit her there? When Papa's ready, she says, I'll go. The kid has paid his dues and done his grueling summer stints at the canneries up in Alaska. With Ligaya and her mother before she left him, he's picked asparagus, strawberries, grapes, and peaches in the fields of California. You name it, we've picked it, he'd say. I keep thinking of Ligaya's mother fed up. How awful was it, I ask. Sister, you don't want to know. He laughs that knowing laugh. Manong Joey and the old guys join in. Makes me feel kind of foolish. Then the kid switches to his favorite topic, the essence of a true Filipino. You got your big gatherings, your big pig, lots of tuyo, bitter melon, plain hot rice, plain and hot to absorb all that salt, jars of patis, Bagoong to stink up and get happy. Then you got your music and your dancing. Voila! This is heaven, sister. Stop worrying about small things. Voltaire and I start coming by the barber shop at least once a week. The kid calls Voltaire a little brother. The old guys tease us with, Why don't you quit fooling around and let Manong Joey give you both haircuts? Kid and Ligaya disappear for weeks at a time working menial, back-breaking jobs as far away as Texas and Louisiana. Then they'd suddenly appear, browner and just as mysterious as ever. You do what you gotta do, he'd say. Who coined the term Pinoy, I ask. Search me, he replies. Pinoy just is. Part of the cosmos, Ligaya adds. That's an old term, Manong Joey says, from home. What's home, I ask coyly. Again, kid and the old men laugh knowingly. Why do we keep coming here if we aren't wanted, Voltaire asks. Who says we're not wanted? An indignant old man in a white suit shoots back at him. We can't help it. We got big dreams. We know how to suffer, kid says. The old man in the white suit explodes. He's been sitting there fuming, pretending to read a newspaper. Bullshit. You young people don't know what you're talking about. I'm a loyal Filipino, a veteran, and a U.S. citizen, and I'm proud of it. Frankie Matuban makes a dismissive gesture. Shut up, Nemesio. I'm afraid the old guy might pull out a gun or wave bronze medals and purple hearts in our faces, but the kid eventually calms him down. Amador Reyes is the name on his birth certificate, 
but he's known simply as Kid, also known as the Carabao Kid. Some consider him the unofficial spiritual leader of a fast-growing, chaotic, and exuberant Pinoy arts movement in San Francisco. The movement's emblem is the water buffalo, or Carabao. Art and politics are, of course, inexorably intertwined. The Carabao Kid is asked to read his haikus at street fairs, beauty contests, cultural fundraisers, civil rights demonstrations, and rallies against the Vietnam War. You do what you gotta do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Okay. And now we have a special treat. Thank you for visiting AWW while you're here in New York. Tony. Um, okay. Inspired by the Frisco Five hunger strikers in 2016, Tony Robles' Fingerprints of a Hunger Strike vividly captures the flight of black and brown communities against a rapidly gentrifying, gentrifying San Francisco. From the intro of Fingerprints of Hunger, Robles writes, the Frisco Five showed the strength of the community when it unites. It showed that Frisco is still alive despite the efforts to kill its heart and spirit. Born and raised in San Francisco, Tony is the author of Cool Don't Live Here No More, A Letter to San Francisco, as well as two children's books, La Casse and the Manila, Manila Town Fish and La Casse and the Makikaba Hotel, Makibaka Hotel. In 2010, he was nominated for the Pushcart Prize by Lithium Literary Journal for the short story In My Country. He is co-editor and revolutionary worker scholar of Poor Magazine and currently lives in San Francisco where he works as a housing rights advocate and board member of the Manila Town Heritage Foundation. Please welcome Tony Robles. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and good night. You know, coming from uh, San Francisco, we were what, three hours, three hours behind, right? Yeah. East and West. So now I'm three hours ahead. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Jessica. That brings back, you know, your reading and your images of uh, of Uncle Al bring back so uh, so many things that happened. And I was I was pretty young with when a lot of these things were coming down the I Hotel. I was just a young kid. Um, and in the day of, of Trump, you know, we saw on the screen, uh, where were your papers in 1492, right? But we have s people that are abound among us that are such knuckleheads that they're even asking, where were your papers in 1942? So they're getting their numbers like mixed up, right? Um, I appreciate um, the opportunity to read here. How many of you um, heard of a singer named Joe Batan? Yes. And can somebody, who is Joe Batan, sister? And uh, what is he known for? Pardon me? Boogaloo. And there's one other thing he's known for. It goes like this. <laughs> I don't drive beautiful car and I don't own an elegant home and don't have thousands to spend or a seaside cottage on the weekends i'm just a ordinary ordinary guy afro-filipino average kind of guy that's what i am Ordinary man you left behind. So king of Latin soul, Afro-Filipino, Joe Batan. I am myself Filipino and black. And that being said, I want to uh, recognize my mother who's in North Carolina right now. And I think she's watching on Facebook, along with my stepfather and my father who lives in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. 
um, who's a, a San Francisco native. And I usually start things off by reading a poem about my father, and it's called My Father's Music. He had 10,000 record albums, and he had a cinder block on one side, a cinder block on the other side, and he had a slab of wood. And in between the slabs of wood and the cinder blocks, he had jazz, and he had this music that flowed through his blood, flowed through his mind as he went back and forth from his janitorial job on Van Ness Avenue. And check this out, it goes like this. <clears throat> My father's music percolates and palpitates like hot coffee dreaming, a tap dancer's arrival, hitting throats with the right note, going back deep, unopposed. My father's music is caught in a kettle whose grease endured screams and flame of gas stove decisions where curling irons bent notes and contemplated hooks landing on the chin and announcing a verdict on a rippled canvas. And my father's music is an empty cup of my favorite things where soup is made from pain and love is made from rain. My father's music is made in wood when he would, then wouldn't, then would again, and wood is softer than stone, and wouldn't you know it? My father's music is the chamber of cool, poking into the greenness of the sun's estate of ecstatic static. I said my father's music is the chamber of cool, poking into the greenness of the sun's estate of ecstatic static my father's music is sky minus rain divided by sun multiplied by incense in the smoldering pyramid of branches my father's music is the in time pantomime of the heaven hell debate whose defense rests on the eighth day my father's music floats and glides from head to thigh and on that other side where up is down and down is up sticking like Flapjacks whose wings lap, lap, lap the tick-tock oil of greasy time. My father's music skips, bumps, burps, slurps, sizzles on the sunny side of the street. Crackle, pop, bop, pan fried with an egg on top. My father's music. Now, Pat, crackle, pop, bop with an egg on top. See, we might be eating Chinese food after this reading, so if anybody wants to come. Um, so so uh, anyway, um, Jessica mentioned that my uncle had never been to the Philippines. And it's true. You read his work and you think, wow, you know, he talks about ako ay Pilipino, right? Pilipino ako, right? I am the soil vein, mountains of my people. 10,000 islands, 7,000 islands and seas. So he got people thinking about, I guess, the, uh, the unconscious, right? The uh, unconscious identity, right? And then comes Bruno Mars. <laughs> and everybody says, hey, the brother ain't even black, man. He's, uh, what do they call, uh, Leslie, what did we say he was appropriating, right? Appropriating? And I was in a club in Manila, because I had a chance to go two years ago for the first time. I was in a club, and there was a band playing some old stylistic song. Then they had a break, and I said, wow, I went to the singer, I said, hey, brother, I said, that was a great song. You know, stop, look, listen to your heart. And I said, well, you really nailed it. I said, it was great, and I really, really liked it. And he said, um, he looked at me and he says, Oh, so you like that song? That is uh, stylistics. Okay, uh, I'll sing more for you. And I'm like, okay, cool, because he sounded just like the record. And it just made me think about how Filipinos, we adapt. We become our environment. We become the voices around us. And is it mimicry? Or do we blend? Are we hollow, hollow people, right? So this is called uh, My People. My People are great mimics. Just the other night, I saw them swallow up the night, be 
coming the night, wearing the stars in their skin. A Pinoy wailing into a microphone, taking the shape of a Philadelphia singer. Chords plucked from the Philly streets until the club became Philadelphia, and then Pinoy Delphia. And every color bird became that other place where feathers were preened and glasses sat stoically in their ice. My people tap dance on water and become water, moving even while still at every pace, becoming the pace, the hop, skip, and jump. My people can pop wheelies on a unicycle while popping popcorn and the pimples on their faces. My people are great mimics taking the shape of an hourglass and turning it into 24 hours. My people are great mimics with their share of gimmicks becoming ideas that do not sit still, cutting loose like fire. My people are great mimics. They become the tires on the road, the nightsticks, the cars whose lips point towards you and away from you. My lips, my, they mimic the clouds, the lava, and the lizard. They mimic mirrors that deflect any memory of mimicry. You understand what I'm saying? They, def they mimic mirrors that deflect any memory of mimicry. They take the shape of the wind as it collects in their palms. My people are great mimics. They mimic the flute with cavernous throats that pop off popcorn melodies, coughing up peanut shells and candy wrappers. My people are great mimics. My people are great mimics. My people are great mimics. But they do not, I repeat, they do not mimic pain. Pain mimics them. Anyway, um, you know, things that you were talking about, you had Chinatown who lost uh, 9,000 rent-controlled units. In San Francisco, Latino community has been hit very hard. We lost 10,000 Latinos in 10 years, 10,000 Latino families in La Mission, in the mission. In fact, there was a, uh, just the other day, there was a big mural, beautiful mural, mural of uh, Carlos Santana. Somebody threw a bucket of white paint on it, defaced it. Beautiful mural, man, beautiful mural. So they are using love to, uh, to restore that, because that's what we have to counter with. We were in, uh, Washington Square Park yesterday, there was something called a, a race for justice because there was a, a young man who was killed who was a case of mistaken identity in one of the bodegas here. So, uh, so that being said, you know, in solidarity with San Francisco, there's something called CTA, Community uh, Chinatown Tenants Association made up of, of many seniors and they're out really fighting. Gentrification is hitting Chinatown. Some of the tech companies are trying to move in. Um, there's, uh, of course, Airbnb that's taken a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rental, rent control units off the uh, off the market, and that is uh, that's been a a very bad thing. So we are very much in solidarity with uh, with what you're doing here, uh, and of course with the history. The history of the I Hotel uh, that meant so much to uh, to everybody. So um, wanted to kind of uh, see read something about. Uh, there's this thing called uh, mansplaining. Anybody know anything about this? <laughs> mansplaining. How many of you have been mansplained too? Been on the receiving end, meaning receiving end of being a mansplain. Okay, gotcha. So, I want you to think about this. Just put it in, perhaps in your mind, just as food for thought, devil's advocate. Mansplain. Think if you took, but there are certain words that, you know, we have man or men in it that are actually somewhat positive, right? Manila. <laughs> M-A-N. <laughs> Manhattan, menu, we all have to eat, right? Mantis, there was a nice guy at one time, name was Manson. I don't think I should have brought that up. But then uh, there's also something called uh, manure, 
right? So uh, anyway, this is a poem called uh, Mansplain. All of it has collected in my ears. It has uh, hardened over time. All of those bosses and supervisors and others deemed superior. Their voices thick with the hoarseness of time. And I can hear them saying, let me explain something to you. Let me run it down to you. You must not have heard me the first time. Look at me when I'm talking to you. If I got to repeat myself, I'm going to knock the white, black, yellow, red, blue off of you. And it was all explained to me. I was listening. Those men had plenty to say, and most of the time, nobody was listening. And my ears became overloaded with their excesses. But once in a while, those men would say something like, it's good to see you. How you been? You heard from your daddy? What's mom's been up to? And sometimes they'd say, you know, I wish I had a daughter like you. Or I wish I had a son like you. And those things stayed with me. Too many to write down. Too much to explain. So I won't. A couple of wonderful books. Veronica Montez, Benedicta Takes Wing. She's a good friend of mine from the Bay Area. Wonderful short stories. Benedicta Takes Wing. Trafe Pesach. If you don't like Trump, you want to screw Trump, what a wonderful book for the time. Trafe Pesach, it means uh, uh, unkosher Passover. And uh, it's by Hilton Obensing. And the brother talks a lot of shit. I mean, this is a bad book. Trafe Pesach. Uh, also uh, published by Ethereal's Spear Press. Um, I was uh, working as a security guard once, and I was coming home in the middle of the night. And I made a sharp turn on 45th Avenue, and I saw a tail go up in the air. I realized it was a skunk. And uh, you know, I got sprayed, you know. And uh, that smell lingered. This is a poem by the late uh, Thomas F. Bose from uh, Plimpton, Massachusetts, Plimpton with a Y. Never put a leash on a skunk. On a skunk, a leash never put. Nor should you ever step on his foot, lest he raises his tail and you start to wail. As the odor doth permeate, your body it doth penetrate. And you have thoroughly stunk from the skunk. <laughs> How many more minutes do I have? I don't want to be running over, <laughs> running over time. Um, I think, uh, sister, the, the uh, your, your name again, the one for, uh, engineer, sound engineer? Zara. Zara. You're talking about being uh, black and Asian, right? Right? And uh, being, you know, mixed, right? My uncle had an appreciation and a love for multiculturalism of San Francisco. And he used to call this some uh, mixed Filipinos like Frisco Chino Pino. Frisco Chino. So I wrote a poem. It was inspired by him. It's called Frisco Pino. Frisco Pino is a pot of mispronounced names that go undigested, burning in our ears and throat. Frisco Pino is... Filipino from San Francisco. Filipino and black, black and Filipino. Filipino and Mexican, Mexican and Filipino. Filipino and Italian, 
Italian and Filipino, Filipino and Chinese, Chinese and Filipino, Filipino and native, native and Filipino, and other mixtures in our Lola's pot that gave birth to what is Frisco Pino. Frisco Pino is my veins clogged with Dinaguan shadows that live in the pores. And it's never forgetting where you came from. Frisco Pino is fish bones in my throat and socks that smell like adobo. <laughs> it's the shame we have in the parts of us that are the most beautiful. Frisco Pino is the black in us that can't be denied. It's bad and loud with a heart too big for its chest. It's a tattoo that covers our pain. It's the proud lechon skin that covers our bones. Frisco Pino is Filipino from Frisco, Filipino from San Francisco. They say, don't say Frisco. I say, fuck that, say Frisco. Filipino, Frisco Pino is Filipino from Frisco and everything that comes with it. <clears throat> Prettier than all the world, and I'm so proud, I'm so proud, I'm so proud of you, I'm so proud of being loved by you. City of St. Francis, I'm proud of being loved by you. And don't worry, I don't hold that eviction against you. But it did come as a surprise, all wrapped up in a gauze-colored envelope. Just the way it goes, I guess. I'd lived there 45 years. Grew up there. Moms died there at home where she belonged. I got 60 days to vacate. I'm so proud of being loved by you. And Mr. Fair Inspector, I ain't got no ill feeling towards you for looking me up and down as though I were defective while you scrawled my life story on that ticket you wrote me, legible to only a doctor or a pharmacist. I'm proud of being loved by you. And Mr. Officer, I'm not angry that you took my tent and confiscated all my worldly belongings and wrote me a ticket whose intent was to carry out some such law. But my tent had the intent of keeping me warm and dry from the elements. And what was your intention again? Can it be logged in the book of good intent basking over the bent portion of the rainbow? I'm so proud of being loved by you and i don't hold it against you that i being infused with both the rhythm and the blues see an absence of black where black should be such as in soul food restaurants where the black faces aren't seen but black music is played served up on a dish of out of uh, served up on a dish of out of proportion portions of satellite delight and of course in the institutions of hidden learning I don't hold it against you, city of St. Francis. I'm so proud of being loved by you. So if you're, uh, if you're, you know, you live in San Francisco and you're a person of color, you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of emotions, right? Uh, and where is Jacob tonight? Okay, Jacob was my Tagalog teacher. And when I went to the Philippines, I felt like, uh, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know the language, so I took, um, I took Tagalog class, you know. And uh, he, uh, he was a good teacher, you know, because he didn't come across like, well, how, how come you don't know your, your language, right? You know, how come you never took Tagalog? How come you don't speak Tagalog, right? So um, it was cool. I learned a lot. When I got to, the Philippines, I forgot everything that I learned because I was in a cab. I was in a cab, you know. And uh, this is called half. Pil this is a bad poem, anyway. But you know, bad isn't bad. Um, half Filipino in a cab in Manila. I'm going to read it off this. Okay. Glad I even can afford a phone. Okay, half Filipino in a cab in Manila. I had gotten into the cab with an address scribbled on a scrap of paper. 
the few Filipino words I knew denied knowing me. So I'd grasp for a word or two from my swollen or my guilt swollen pockets. Makano always seemed to be one of the words. And I got into the cab and my and I got into the cab and the driver's face was covered in a layer of sweat. Where are you from? He said he asked. Taga San Francisco Ako, I answered. And the meter kept running as the pause in the conver conversation became wider. <laughs> Halfway to my destination, he said, you're half Filipino. It was neither a question or assertion, occupying a space between two places, my ears. And as the cab moved, I thought about the half Filipino of my skin, of my blood. I thought about the half plates of adobo I ate, half plates of Filipino spaghetti I sucked through my teeth, half Filipino poetry I wrote with a pen, half filled with ink from a half-filled pot of adobong pusit. Half-heard words emanating from my father's mouth. Half pint of blood I gave to the blood bank. Half tongue I've dipped in bagoong while trying to learn Tagalog. Half sticks of gum I chewed in an attempt to clear the palate of my past. I'm half Filipino, I told the cab driver. I will, I continued, pay you half fare for this half a taxi ride. <laughs> the cab driver's eyes met mine in the rear view. You are Filipino, he said. <laughs> and that's the half of it. <laughs> so maybe I'll just read, I'll just read maybe, maybe two more. Um, and then we'll be, uh, be done. This is a uh, stream of consciousness poem, which is borderline stream of obnoxiousness. So you, you be the judge. This is a poem called Day Seven. The Tyrannosaurus tossed his dentures into the collection plate. Just another Sunday morning of cartoon reruns and syndicated rituals and bullets that stop in midair and switch directions, defying even my line of thought and trajectory of reasoning. And the seasoning was tainted with the arrival of the first boats, but it was a hell of a party. And the hegemony life jackets were provided and we all throw up hand signs to block out the smoke screens and while the sun is blocked don't feel bad because at least you dodged a cancer bullet if only for today but the sun is always ready to bite and the kingdom that didn't come is a half check made away so hold on to your piece or parts and the polar bears are center stage floating to a military base near you and can you put a little more ice in my glass of tea they say that God is watching you, but who is watching him? Turned on the TV, and one guy has him on the 50-yard line of the biggest stadium in town, saying all things work for good to those who love. We cut to commercial, wide shot, car in need of repair, parts going bad. Wait, that ain't no car commercial, that's me. Parts not working the way they used to. Love light as exciting as, love light, life exciting as a can of paint that used to be a can of paint. But who's counting the breaths? And there's a pill for that. And also for correctile dysfunction. Cholesterol levels rising along with the mercury. And is my ticket still redeemable for the buffet line? I found it in an old wrinkled suit in the thrift store graveyard preserved next to the plaid golf slacks and bones of an old caddy who can still show you a thing or two. Is it presentable? My shadow sold it to me, said it doesn't fit him anymore. I'm just taking up blood space. Those shot glasses sweat my eyes of all that's left. Now smile. Okay. So anyway, thank you very, very much. I'm just going to leave, leave you with one more. And, you know, when I get into, uh, you know, reading the stuff on the phone, you know, I have my glasses here. 
Oh, one thing I wanted to share with you as well. I was in Washington Square. Washington Square Park, right? Which was nice. And I was uh, eating a falafel with my cousin Leslie. It was wonderful. It was a tasty falafel. And I thought, wow, this is a wonderful place. The birds were coming. The, you know, and the, I, I dropped a few things. And I was getting into it. You know, it was, it, was a moment, it was a moment of falafel bliss. And then I looked, and uh, I realized that I had gotten, like, you know, falafel juice on my San Francisco Giants jacket. Um, so that's an unforgettable poetic moment. Um, so anyway, again, thank you, uh, AAWW, and, of course, Jessica Hagedorn. And, uh, you know, the, all the fight, all, t tell me the, the stuff that you're doing with, uh, with the youth and, you know, it, you know, both of our struggles on each coast are very much, uh, very much connected. And I was, I was feeling, you remind me of, a, of an activist in, Sa in San Francisco. Her name is Pam Tao Lee. And she was, back in the day, she was involved with the I Hotel struggle. And she ain't stopped. I mean, she's like a buzzsaw. I mean, she's an, ad she's a, uh, an activist. Uh, goes back and forth to the Philippines. So she's still very much a part of what's going on. So anyway, there was Carnaval that happened in uh, San Francisco. Uh, it's a festival that happens every, uh, every year. And um, so this is called Carnaval. Carnaval. Every color feather, every follicle preened, every plucked dream, all flavors melting on the tongue. Dance with the sun, dance with the ground, drink the water of memory, splash back at sorrows. Afflicted with an ingrown sound, we cradle it, the yoke of everything we are, swelling like a balloon, bellies and breasts filled with sound. Pregnant with songs unsung, bursting forth, birth waters from the shells of coconuts, cooling the swelter of the street, the swelter of our skin, the swelter of our lives. Carnaval, congueros, timbaleros, speaking the language of hands, climbing upward, clutching at our roots, salsa, cumbia, Frisco soul, Frisco sound of black and brown, the brothers and sisters emerge. What's up, blood? How you been? What's up with you? Ain't no place for the tone deaf. No place for the offbeat. Offbeat rhythm of colonizers' bones dying of thirst only to be quenched by rocks. Our exiled walks and talks and rituals of higher frequency move like waves touching with the wet of our musical tears making its way into the heart's doorway where squeaky stairs and doors and old greasy pots and pans keep us alive and our hips give way and sway and shake the very foundations of this city from the golden gate to the pyramid that would make an earthquake look out of place in a dance contest. Carnaval, 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 low riders resting, leaning underneath every gesture, every hum, every click, every key that fits the heart. Rims and radiators with the interior of our soul in an oldie from Little Anthony and the Imperials. Let me tell you that it hurts, hurts so bad. It makes me feel so sad. It's gonna hurt so bad to see you again. And the Impalas, the Impalas glide with the grace of a feather, the gentle grace of a feather to the sound of Carnaval. Thank you. And I want to say that I want to dedicate this to Carlos Gutierrez. He was the, uh, the head of a group called HOMI in San Francisco. It was a youth organization in La Mission. Uh, he was, I think, maybe 40, 39 years old. He passed away several days ago. So this reading is dedicated to uh, Carlos Gutierrez of La Mission. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get into that. You know, yeah, you know, there was, there's been uh, police shootings in San Francisco. Uh, a young brother named Ale Alex Nieto, uh, Latino brother from uh, Bernal Heights, he was eating a burrito up on Bernal Heights Hill. Um, somebody from out of town, I guess one of the gentrifier, gentrifier wave, called the cops on Alex. He was shot. Uh, 56 times by SFPD. There was another brother named Amilcar Perez Lopez, immigrant. Uh, he was shot in the back by, by SFPD. And another 
a brother named um, Luis Gongora Pat. And he was uh, immigrant. He was um, what? I mean, no, you know, I forget. But uh, those have received. And then, of course, I mean, Mario Woods, right? You all have heard of Mario Woods. He was the brother that was shot by SFPD, San Francisco Police Department, uh, 56 times. So they, you know, people just had enough. The hunger strikers went on strike. Uh, they, they did a hunger strike in front of the Mission Police Station, which is in the heart uh, of the, it's in the Latino community. And the hunger strike lasted about 17 days, I think. And uh, it brought a lot of pressure. People from all over were, you know, uh, were, were, were in support. Long story short, it led to the uh, eventual, um, uh, not dismissal, but a resignation of police chief uh, Greg Sur. So what the advocates are trying to do right now, they're trying to get uh, the DA, pressure the DA to kill these cops because they've been killing, you know, majority black and brown uh, youth, black and brown people in San Francisco. So, you know, our, you know it's like, you know, it's hunting season, right? And um, so it's really galvanized a movement um, of a lot of people. So, so again, I'm sorry I didn't bring that up. I mean, you're, you do reading and you, everything. Um, there's a rapper by the name of Equipto. He's on tour right now in Houston. Um, Equipto is uh, E-Q-U-I-P-T-O. He was one of the hunger strikers. He's a great rapper. He does a, he does a song, actually. It's called uh, Heart and Soul, and it's all about San Francisco, and about the pride of being uh, from, uh, from Frisco. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, so thank you so much, Tomi, Tony, and Jessica. Thank you all for being here this evening. We are done for tonight, so you're more than welcome to buy a book, have some wine, mingle, talk. Uh, the authors will be here for a little while longer. And thank you so much for being here. Have a great night. Thank you.